We just had the fourth installment of the Dark Anthology series drop called The Devil In Me. And while this interactive story has much of the details up front for the audience to see, there is also a hell of a lot to discover from small documents and collectibles found throughout the game itself. Now, let's begin with an overall summary of the key events of the game. However, since the Dark Anthology series gives the player multiple choices, and main characters can die at different parts of the story, it can get a little bit messy. So we're going to stick to the stuff that doesn't change. It also goes without saying that this will contain major spoilers for the devil in me. It will include identities, events, and take place before the main game storyline and a little bit of background stuff. So if you have not played the game, you have been warned. We begin the story as Jeff and Marie, a couple that is visiting the World's Fair Hotel in the 1890s. The hotel itself is owned by a mysterious owner that helps the couple to their rooms. Things go astray and ultimately this newlywed couple meet their end. We find out that the name of the killer and the owner of the World's Fair Hotel is called H.H. H. Holmes. If you are unaware, H.H. H. Holmes was an actual person. He did own a hotel during the 1890s, also named the World's Fair Hotel, much like what was depicted in the prologue scene of the game. Holmes did in fact murder many of the guests within the walls of the hotel. He was responsible for more than 10 deaths, and while the exact number of victims is still not entirely clear, there is a possibility that the number could be as high as 50 to 100 people. He was ultimately found guilty of those crimes in 1896. He was sentenced to death and buried in concrete because he believed that the devil was in him and that he wished to be buried in concrete so the devil couldn't get out. Hence the uh, inspiration for the title of the game. We cut to an individual watching a documentary film crew talk about themselves and what appears to be some kind of behind the scenes footage. The characters on screen later turn out to be our set of characters for the duration of the game. They are creating a documentary on the killer of H.H. H. Holmes, the same person we witnessed during the opening dialogue of the game. Now, the events of the film crew take place in 2022, as we find out later on. This means that this is taking place a whole 130 years later than the prologue. Charlie is the boss of the group and the director of the crew. He informs them all that they have been invited to a replica hotel of H.H. Holmes by Mr. Dumet on an island and they are free to film footage for their documentary there, which big old Charlie absolutely loves the idea of. Turns out that the documentary crew will be traveling in style as the hotel is offering a limousine pickup to take them to the island. We get a little glimpse of our driver here and I will just say to pay very close attention to those little mitts of his because we will be seeing them a lot more later on. Once the group arrives, they're greeted by Mr. Demet, who will ferry them across to the hotel, and we see a few scenes that show Mr. Demet is incredibly jumpy and private, which is the first sign that something is a little bit off, since he invited the film crew to the hotel for the entire purpose of filming their documentary. Demet tells the crew to leave their belongings at the ferry, and will organize them to be brought to the hotel. A few of the girls find a few things out, and around the premises, such as a broken stiletto and a family photo of Demet, while also encountering what appears to be a groundskeeper of sorts. We also see the groundskeeper with a luggage cart, and we can assume that they are the ones responsible for moving the luggage up to the hotel. Now, outside the hotel, Kate sees a small girl in the window. At first glance, this can be a bit of a horror trope. A little girl staring out the window, and when you look back, they disappear. It's ultimately a red herring, but I like the small little Easter egg. Once in the house, Demet gives the crew the room keys and explains for them all to meet back at the dining area for dinner at 8pm. The crew agrees and begins to walk to their room. On the way, Erin sees Demet meeting with his daughter. Gets a little bit of a spook, but goes back to her room with Jamie. Jamie eventually sees Demet and his daughter running for the ferry. Now look, this is a big red flag. If the person that just invited you to their secret island hotel is running to the ferry that brought you to the very island, you should probably be very worried. Now, as far as the summary is concerned, I want to leave it just there. And if you've played the game, you'll know that there is a hell of a lot more to the story that plays out in front of the viewer. But I feel that this initial premise gives us more than enough to jump off from. So I'll just assume that you've played through the main story at this stage. Some of the characters will notice that particular pieces of their gear are missing from their bags. For example, Charles is missing his cigarettes that gets his boxes in a hell of a twist, while Mark has lost his camera lens. This in particular is a callback to how H.H. H. Holmes operates. You see, in the prologue, Jeff mentions how his razor has gone missing from his bag. He assumes that he just forgot to pack it, no big deal. We later see that actually Holmes had stolen it and used it against the couple later on. So when you contrast that to present day, it's exactly the same. Our very first clue as to who the killer actually is. 
the groundskeeper, since he was the only person that had access to the characters' bags prior to them receiving them again in the hotel lobby, since he was the only one that went to collect them at the ferry. But that also doesn't explain Demet's involvement in this whole thing. We saw him fleeing, so is he in some way responsible? A bit strange, since this is his home, and if he is not the killer, then maybe helping or complicit in some way. To answer this, let's break down what happened before our group of characters arrived at the hotel. In the hotel lobby, there is a hotel registrar that the characters had to sign when they first arrived. When you look inside, we find a whole list of names of all the people that have checked into the hotel. To begin with, we have Brad Fisher, Rachel Davies, Jackie Fiddles, Scott Thorne, and Grace Fletcher. All of them checked in on the 29th of September 2022 and ultimately checked out on the 4th of October 2022. If you continue down the page, we see a Harrison Lee, Lewis Lee, Thomas Hall, Cecil Hall, and Kurt Hall. All checked in the very next day on the 5th of October and then checked out on the 18th of October. Now, when I say check out, you could probably get an inkling of what that really means in a murder hotel, but I, I digress. We see that Joseph Morello, Michelle Morello, Francis Morello, Natalie Morello, and Bethany Morello checked in exactly one week prior to our cast of characters, who have also signed into the registrar, obviously without the checkout date. Now, we actually get an invitation letter that was sent from Gratham Demet, the owner of the hotel, to Joseph Morello. It explains that Morello's publisher had told Demet that Morello was interested in talking with him. And he goes on to mention that the construction of his complete replica of the World's Fair Hotel is essentially a tourist experience, and that a person of Morello's knowledge would be invaluable to provide insight into the hotel prior to the official opening. He goes on to invite exactly five people of his choosing to come, and visit and keep the invitation confidential. Joseph agrees and says that he'll bring his family. Now, there are a few things of note here to break down. First and foremost, the number of people invited to the hotel. If you look in the hotel registry, you will see that every single group that visited was in a group of exactly five people. We later find a message that explains that the killer had realized that the perfect number of victims for the hotel that he could manage successfully was five at one time. And also, let's not forget to mention that Morello has a publisher and that he had some form of insight to provide for Gratham to Met. Now, what exactly was that? Well, in the library of the hotel, you can find a book called Was He the Devil? It's a book written about H.H. H. Holmes, a true crime author called Joseph Morello. This explains the publisher. And since the killer is obviously very much influenced by Holmes, it makes Morello a perfect target. Now, I'm sure many of you are curious about what happened to each and every one of those guests. Luckily, we do have some information on exactly what happened. So let's break it all down. We'll start with the Morello family. In the butchery, you can find a bunch of pigs hanging up. Pretty normal stuff for a butchery. But if you take a look around the corner, you'll notice that this one is suspiciously non-pig-like. Turns out this is Natalie Morello, one of Joseph Morello's daughters. During the pool area, you'll find a hand. You don't exactly know who it belongs to at this stage, but later on, once you're outside, you'll find an ID badge of a Francis Morello not far from a wallet with a little photo of a young Bethany Morello and her uncle Francis Morello at a theme park. It has Bethany thanking her uncle for riding on the ride with her, you can unfortunately find out what happened to Francis in the shed not far from these items. Also missing a hand, suggesting that that hand you find inside the pool area is probably his. And then there's Mrs. Morello, who you find in a less than stellar condition. It's pretty gory and we want to keep YouTube happy, so I won't show it, but, but you can pretty much put her on the dead list, which leaves Joseph Morello and Bethany Morello. Now, some of you have probably clued on already, but you can find a book about a Manny Sherman, a name that you should probably remember because we will be discussing just who that is in a bit, but it was once again written by none other than Joseph Morello. And when you flip that bad boy over, it's our fairy friend. So if you're a little bit confused, the person that we were meeting at the beginning of the game is not Grantham Demet. It's actually Joseph Morello, the previous victim of the murder hotel just one week prior. And the little girl with him? Bethany Morello, which explains why he wanted to split as quickly as possible when the new group arrived. But it does leave a few questions unanswered. Why was he helping the killer? Did he escape and survive? Why was he pretending to be someone that he's not? Well, you can actually find out their face later on in the game when you reach the docks. You can find them both unfortunately killed. And if you want to know how, The Devil in Me has a variety of different endings depending on the decisions that you make throughout. 
and in one particular ending, you can have Kate and Mark attempt to escape via the ferry, and it shows exactly how the killer dispatches the people that try to escape in that way. I still have no idea why they didn't just duck when they saw the gun, but whatever. In an earlier part shown in that very ending, Mark is trapped with Kate on a table. It's not a fun situation, but the killer puts on a TV recording of Joseph Morello explaining why he summoned them to the island, and the situation he was in with having to save his daughter. Not much unlike the situation Mark and Kate find themselves in here. So the killer gives them a choice. Help summon another group of victims to the island to be a part of his murder game, or the person on the table dies. That leads them to make the phone call, greet them while pretending to be Grantham Demet, and so on and so on. The cycle continues and you begin to get the idea. One hell of a revelation. And to be honest, it makes a hell of a lot more sense why he didn't want to be photographed, or why he was cagey at the original meeting at the ferry. Now, as for other groups, we do find a wedding ring in a pool area that belongs to Lewis Lee from the group that came into the hotel a few weeks prior to our cast of characters. And at the beginning of the game, Kate and Jamie can find a bunch of boxes outside near the groundskeeper that has a bunch of dangerous chemicals, signs and stickers, all of which were purchased by Grantham Demet. This is due to the ways that the killer disposes of the victims and separately how he preserves the bodies. We saw a little bit with Joseph's wife earlier, but it comes up a few times in the game. We can find a clipboard that has a variety of steps and experiments to preserve bodies. It shows that the killer has been trying to figure it out. It's mentioned on the clipboard that Harrison Lee was one of the people that he has been trying to preserve. Now, I'm not entirely sure if this is the case or not, as there isn't really a concrete way to confirm if it is or isn't, but I do believe one of the people dressed up as the doctors in this scene could possibly be Harrison Lee and another person from his group. We also get a letter from Cecil to Kurt Hall explaining that she wished he didn't bring Harrison along on the trip, even stating that he was a famous fiction horror writer. Not much unlike Joseph Morello. And when you consider that the crew that we play are creating a documentary on the same kind of stuff, not too dissimilar to an author, you can begin to build an MO. We don't really get much information on many of the other characters on the hotel registry, but what we do find out is that the construction crew of the building that helped build the hotel itself in 2017 also met some unfortunate ends. Down in the basement, you can find a logbook from General Contractors. When open, one of the workers is cataloging the events of the construction during 2017, five years prior to the events of this main story. It explains that the crew arrived on the island on the 17th of January 2017. They met with a Mr. Belknap, who is the proprietor, meaning the owner. They start the excavation of the basement as some time passes. By the 2nd of February, they had begun their work on the 1st and 2nd floors and noted that some of their gear had gone missing. They file a report and request replacements from Mr. Belknap. And since we know that our killer has a proclivity for stealing stuff, we can probably assume that this is our killer. And now we also have a name, Mr. Belknap. But let's move on. On the 5th, one of the workers, James Kelly left a note explaining that there was an emergency and that he needed to leave, without telling anyone directly which I have to say is a bit odd. A few weeks later, on the 18th, another one of these loyal workers left the project. There is no explanation of a letter, but it is mentioned that they had left them high and dry. They make quick work of the construction over the following month, and on the 20th of March, there are more reports of missing equipment, and it actually marks the third replacement request for just the month of March. Once the main construction has completed, Belknap requests additional work be done in the spa area under the hotel. The crew agrees the terms after speaking to James Kelly via letters, and a group of Laura, Monica, Ryan, Frank, and the Ryder stay behind to get the job done in a sort of skeleton crew. On the 29th, Laura went to install a tannoy system with Mr. Belknap, and he says that she isn't feeling very well and that she's sleeping it off in one of the rooms. Another big red flag. Also, James Kelly hasn't mentioned anything about the rest of the crew that was meant to come and help do this job. A day later, Laura has still not come out of her room, and now Monica has resigned. Kelly won't return any of the calls or letters, and the writer says that they will leave for the mainland in the morning with Frank and Laura. Now, you can actually find the resignation letter from Monica to Jesse, uh, Jesse being the name of the person that's writing in the logbook. They say that they quit and not to come looking for them. And I do want to mention that there are many different letters and documents that you find throughout the game, and we will go over many of them in this video. But one thing that is noticeable is the handwriting. For example, this resignation letter. I want you to pay very close attention 
to the way that the A is written and the F is written specifically. They are very unique and very unlikely that multiple people would write them in that exact way, but we will come back to that soon. As you search much of the underground spa area, you will find IDs of every single member of the construction crew, accompanied by a mannequin that looks a lot like the pictures on the identification. Since this was five years ago, it's possibly unlikely the killer was able to preserve the bodies for that amount of time, so the mannequins are the only way for him to be able to, uh, I don't know, show off his kills. And on the topic of mannequins, I think the behavior of the killer could give insight into who this person is. And we saw the use of these mannequins a lot earlier in the game at the dinner table, when he replicated the dinner scene from earlier when the characters were discussing Demet, who was actually Morello, but they didn't know that at the time, and when he was fleeing the island. The reason for this is relatively simple. It's an intimidation tactic, but also it's the killer's way of bringing life to his victims. A bit of a freaky contrast to him in reality taking the life from them, but it's also a way to relive the moments. When the characters find their way to the control room, there is a lot of insights into the mindset of this killer. You can find the character's pictures up on a wall next to a map of Chicago. He knows where they lived prior to coming to the island, and the little sticky notes next to the pictures depicted the personality traits of the entire crew, fears that they have, addictions that they have, things that he can exploit once they arrive at the hotel. There is even a medical file of each one of the crew members. Somehow the killer has managed to get medical files of doctor visits, medications that they're on, illnesses, weaknesses, everything. This shows that the killer is incredibly meticulous and doesn't do anything on impulse. Everything is calculated and each moment is specifically designed for every character. We have further evidence of his proclivity to background checks on his victims ahead of time. When you play Kate, you can even find a newspaper that describes a very sensitive moment in Kate's past, something that very few people know about. When Kate was in college, she had a friend called Shelby, whom Kate was meant to meet up with one night. Kate, unfortunately, slept in, and while Shelby was waiting for her, she was killed by a stalker. Kate blamed this on herself, and it actually gave her PTSD. You can actually see it in her medical records, which she takes anxiety pills for. So the fact that the killer not only knew about the sore spot in Kate's past, but also the fact that she blames herself for the death, and to ultimately use that against her shows a high level of intelligence from the killer. We can also see a notepad in the control room that was written by the killer describing patterns that he observed in Michelle. This Michelle mentioned is most likely Michelle Morello, the wife of Joseph. It describes that she's barely alone that she gets noticeably more tired towards the end of the day, and how to try to separate her from the group, which means that he is also keenly observant. Also, did you notice the A's or the F? Does it look awfully familiar? Well, we know that without a doubt that the person that hand wrote on this notepad is the killer responsible for the deaths of the people at the hotel. And when we compare that to the resignation letter, it's the complete same handwriting. Meaning that realistically, Mr. Belknap was forging letters to the construction crew as a way of hiding the disappearing bodies, making it look like they quit. Over the course of a two-month construction, he managed to pick them off one by one until there was nobody left. Not to mention his use of fake recordings that you can find of Charlie describing wanting his group to be killed, and that he brought them there for the killer. This is carefully placed for Aaron to find and creates doubt and distrust amongst the group. And then you can find a doctor text message conversation from Jamie, who is the love interest for Aaron, saying that she isn't her type. Another way to play with the heads of the crew and helps divide them as much as humanly possible, since it's much easier for him to do what he does if they are not working together against him, instead going on their own. This dude's no slouch. We also get some information on his entire getup, the costume that he decides to wear and the mask that he wears. We can find some concept pictures and art in the control room of different looks that he wanted to go with. Each of them is created with H.H. Holmes in mind as a clear inspiration. In fact, he wanted to look exactly like him, from the clothes to the face. There is also a receipt for the actual hat that H.H. Holmes used, meaning that the killer has a significant amount of money that wouldn't be cheap. 
There's also a letter on the desk of an email thread between an Amber Harris and a Brandon Day on the 6th of June 2017. It appears that Brandon Day is purchasing a custom-made mask and asks that the production be completely confidential. So we now have another name that could be added to the mix of who this killer could possibly be. So we have to ask ourselves the big question. Who is the killer exactly? Well, I know who, and I'll tell you right now. It's Grantham Demet. Or Richard Belknap. Also Brandon Day. And even a Ned Yoke was used. Well, it's technically all of them, but they're all the same person. These people are not separate people. They're all just aliases used by the killer. None of them has actual identity. But if you are curious to what his real name is, it's Hector Whale on Monday. Now, this is a name that I deliberately said nothing about up until this point, since there's so much stuff that you can find regarding this character. And there's a few pieces of lore that you can find that are created to sort of throw you off the trail of Monday, but I assure you that it is him, and we will go over the ridiculous amount of evidence that shows that it is. If you play the game without giving much thought to the collectibles, you'll probably finish the game with having really no idea of who the killer is. But after reading the evidence, it's pretty clear. Let's start with the mundane stuff that could easily be explained away. The first noticeable thing that you find out about Monday is an audio recording between a man called Manny Sherman and an FBI agent called Agent Hector Monday. If the name Manny Sherman rings a bell, it's because this is the name of a serial killer that Joseph Morello was writing the book about. I mentioned a little bit earlier on. You see, Sherman was a serial killer that Monday investigated and ultimately captured. He went on to interview him, and Sherman mentions how he was inspired by H.H. H. Holmes. The main reason is the fact that he was the very first serial killer in America. The one that wrote the playbook, as he put it. Monday is curious and continues to probe him for more before the recording ends. So now we know about this FBI agent Hector Monday. A little later on, you can find a badge of Agent Monday in the waste disposal, not to mention also being able to find his FBI jersey as well. Now, this alone is not enough to make any solid connection. Possibly Monday is a victim of the killer. We don't know. Well, there is a mention earlier in the game by Kate that explains that she used to investigate cases on serial killers like the Zodiac and H.H. Holmes, and that many people like them like to create alternate versions of themselves and don't like to use their normal selves, or possibly don't even like their normal selves, a way to escape their previous identity in order to assume a new one. And one thing that we have not seen from the killer is his face or his voice. No matter the situation, he does not talk, instead gets others to talk for him, and wears a mask to hide his face. Now, we can find Agent Monday's ID card, which shows that he was a part of a behavioral science unit in 1989. This is a little cool piece of information for anyone that might be a fan of Mindhunter on Netflix. Just wanted to throw that in there. But noticeably, the picture of Monday has been completely covered up. Hidden. Is it a coincidence, or possibly the killer wanting to erase his past self? Well, we can also find an FBI photograph of new recruits at FBI training. One of the people in the picture has had their face completely covered up, much like the ID card was. Now, there are no names shown in the photo, but since we have only heard of a single FBI agent this entire game, and have not been told of any other... I think it's pretty safe to say that this is probably Agent Monday in this photo as well, with his face crossed out much like the ID card. And I think it's important to listen to the rest of the tapes between Manny Sherman and Agent Monday to get a better idea of who this guy is. In the second recording, it's all Sherman talking, despite Agent Monday being present. He continues to praise Holmes, explaining that unlike most killers that do their thing at the target's home or place, Holmes, however, mastered what is called the honey trap, bringing them to him in his own environment. He goes on to explain how Holmes named his hotel the World's Fair Hotel, only a few miles away from the World Fair Hotel itself. Due to this, people thought that the hotel was the actual official hotel of the fair. No shortage of targets. Sherman learned from this and took over a block of houses that were scheduled to be demolished. However, Sherman would contact relatives to sell the house, and when they visit, That would be his honeypot. He goes on to say to Agent Monday that he can observe and analyze him as much as that he wants, but he will never truly understand. Never really know how it feels. And he taunts him about it. 
another thing of note, which I think is important to bring up, is that Monday appears to give Sherman a few cigarettes and a sign of good faith, possibly a sign that he's warming up to him. And we already established that the killer is highly intelligent in their preparation and research into the people before entering his hotel. And also the ability to figure out what gets on a person's nerves or the way to disrupt a person's way of thinking. Like taking away Charlie's cigarettes, for example. Then we have the fact that Agent Monday is part of the behavioral department of the FBI. Not to mention we have a degree certificate in psychology in the lighthouse that belongs to none other than Hector Monday. That would mean that the killer would have a degree in psychology, which would explain his ability to be able to find the weakest parts of a person's psyche and how to prey upon that. The third recording opens up with Sherman mentioning that Monday brought him an entire carton of cigarettes, instead of the normal individual ones like last time. Now this could be because Monday is growing more fond of Sherman as the interviews continue, or it could simply be a tactic to help get Sherman to spill more info. Both are plausible. Sherman goes on to ask Monday why he hasn't asked any questions and what's going on with him, that he seems different, and goes on to say that he wishes that he had more time to beat Holmes' kill count of over 200, and brags that even though the DA knows about the relatives, they don't know about all the rejects or the misfits, the ones that nobody notices that goes missing. He continues to explain that his father always told him to make his mark on the world, and that for him that was what his killings were. If you were to ask anyone on the street to name serial killers, that majority of them would be able to name between 5 or 10 before starting to struggle to think of names. But if you were to ask them what the names of the detectives were that caught them, well, they wouldn't be able to. Because no one cares. Nobody makes movies about the detectives. He then continues to mock Monday by saying that he has made his mark on the world, but has he? This is clearly showing Sherman is creating doubt and playing on the thoughts that are already running around in the curious mind of Monday. Somebody that has a clear fascination with Sherman, his thought process in the mind of a killer, possibly leading him to want to see what it's like for himself. In fact, Agent Monday had a psychological test done, and it was concluded that his investigation into Sherman had become an obsession, something that he was using as an excuse to not deal with grief, particularly the death of his mother. We also find out quite a lot about Monday's mother, and more importantly, the childhood of Agent Monday. In the library, you can find a book that contains a snippet of a newspaper about births. We see a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Hall had a daughter on June 10th, and another couple called Wright had a son on the same day, while at the bottom, the Monday family announced the birth of their son Hector Whalen Monday on June 11th. If you remember back to previous guests at the hotel that we saw earlier in the registry, a group of them had the surname Hall the same surname as the family on the sheet of paper announcing the birth of Monday. Could it be another coincidence, or are things actually starting to add up? Don't worry, there is still plenty more. If you have made it this far into the video, please do let me know down below. And let me know if you think that this is enough to convince you that it's a Monday. If not, I have a bunch more background information for you. On July 7th, 1965, Monday's mother writes to his father to tell him that he has had a son and wanted to update him since he hasn't seen her in six months. She goes on to say that she can't do it alone and needs him back there. It's also mentioned that Monday was born only a few weeks ago, which would make him 57 at present time. And we also find out that the childhood of Hector Monday wasn't a great one. We find notes from a doctor that assessed Hector when he was seven years old in 1972, and it mentioned that he had bruising that had worsened, likely from an adult rather than other school kids. Further checkups suggest the same thing, and eventually they found him to be undernourished and underweight, so it was rough for him. Also the typical type of upbringing for serial killers. Not always, but past trauma can be a big aspect. This leads to Monday's behaviour deteriorating as he got into elementary school, and we find a message from his childhood principal that explains that he has been acting aggressively towards other kids, and to get in contact with them immediately. And now that we know a bit more about where Agent Monday began, let's get into the fourth and final recording between Manny Sherman and Hector Monday. This one is a little bit different to the others since it's shown to you within a scene by the killer himself. It's an interview room, set up with papers on the desk and a preserved body smoking a cigarette, with the killer on the side that normally the cop would be sitting at. Sherman goes on to compare what he did as a serial killer to art. 
It ultimately says that Monday needs to become an artist. Sherman says that he can see it in Monday's eyes and that he can't be fooled. Monday is just like him deep down. Monday ends up attacking Sherman and ultimately Sherman says that Monday has a lot of potential as an artist. We find a newspaper titled The Beast of Arkansas Behind Bars, which was addressing Sherman's capture by Agent Monday. And while later this impressed the FBI so much that they requested Monday be moved onto a separate case of a potential serial killer in Chicago. And it's mentioned that Monday had been working as a profiler, training up new detectives in the FBI. Now, if you're wondering what happened to Sherman, there is an article that you can find in the third installment of the series, House of Ashes, that describes his final sentence, and ultimately he died as a result. And what is equally creepy and interesting is the fact that you can find a local newspaper article titled Beast Body Burgle. And it explains that the body of Manny Sherman was stolen from its grave. And given the killer's ability to preserve bodies along with the literal setup of the very interviews that were happening between Monday and Sherman. And with the cigarette, the body that was sitting in the room with the final recording played was Manny Sherman himself. Monday's mentor when it came to killing. And it wasn't long until he put those teachings into practice. You see, Monday was sent to investigate the Chicago killer, remembering that Monday had already resided in Chicago. And the two victims found from the Chicago killer had some very strange injuries. For example, one was missing an ear, while the other was missing teeth. Ironically, you can find an animatronic head while searching the workshop, which is where the killer creates all of his mannequins. The head that you find contains human teeth and an ear that had been sewn on. These are clearly the trophies that the Chicago killer took, which means that the person that owns the hotel is likely the same person that Monday was sent to investigate. And as time went on, police began to suspect that Agent Monday could possibly be the Chicago killer. In fact, they put out an APB, which led to a police officer to go and search Agent Monday's premises. Upon doing so, they found blood everywhere and a body within the premises. While calling for backup, they were ultimately killed by the Chicago killer, FBI agent Hector Monday. You can find this police officer's badge, and we can see that his name was Carl Stanley. If you watch the video associated with the badge itself, you can see exactly what happened to Carl. This is not the only stuff that happened around this stage with Agent Monday. You might have remembered how I mentioned that Monday's abusive mother had passed away. Well, we can see that Lucinda Monday was put into a resting home in August of 1992 named Twilight Prairie. They thank Hector for choosing their home and that visitors are encouraged to visit as much as humanly possible. Later on, we also find a medical record dated in 1997 that Lucinda Monday, while accompanied by her son, visited the hospital complaining of a variety of ailments. Testing showed that she had actually developed lung cancer. This caused Hector to fall off the wagon a little bit. We can find an audio recording in the control room from the Twilight Perry retirement home, ringing Hector Monday to address some concerns from the home and its residents. It turns out that Hector had been recording audio from his dying mother, getting her to say very strange things. While the retirement home understood that you want to have lasting memories of loved ones, the subject matter of the recordings disturbed many of the other residents. They then asked Hector to refrain from doing it any longer. Inside the safe at the end of the game, using the code to open it, you can actually find the funeral invitation for Lucinda Monday, who passed away in 1998. It also mentions that she passed peacefully in the presence of her son. And due to the fact that this is taking place so close to the Manny Sherman interview, suggests that Hector Monday actually killed Lucinda and faked it being her diagnosis. And it doesn't get much better for Lucinda, I'm afraid. We find a letter from the cemetery caretaker explaining that he had noticed significant displacement to the grave of Lucinda and that while it could be wildlife, he would like Hector to view the grave. Unfortunately, this isn't a case of wildlife. Exactly like Manny Sherman, her body had been dug up and taken. We actually get to see a shot of a woman sitting in a chair speaking to the groundskeeper when the crew first arrived at the island, during the time that the groundskeeper was moving the bags to the hotel. There is a shot from her side that displays a very unusual skin tone, and much later in the game you can actually just see her sitting in the chair within the house. Once you find her, it's, it's obvious that this is once again a preserved body, and the 
voice lines that come from the microphone that was attached to her mouth. The very same recordings that the retirement home asked Hector Monday to stop doing while he visited his mother. This shows that the only person that would have access to these voice recordings would be Monday himself. The fact that he exhumed the bodies of Lucinda and Manny Sherman, arguably the two closest people in his life, and displayed them in the exact way that he had the most memories of them. And once we go back to the topic of the police officer that was killed in the home of Agent Monday, this meant that he was a wanted man. He was being searched for. His identity as the Chicago killer was exposed and Monday had to take action. There is a newspaper that you can find, Shoeshine Killer Killed, and that the remains of FBI agent Monday had been found within the abandoned warehouse. Since it was a fire that ultimately killed him, there was no way to identify the body except for dental records. So once they checked the dental records, they were able to confirm that it was indeed Agent Monday. Now, there are a few things to break down here. It's confirmed by police that Monday is the shoeshine killer, aka the Chicago killer. Secondly, the fact that the body was found within the abandoned building is fitting since abandoned houses and warehouses were the hunting ground for many Sherman, the very man he became obsessed with and viewed as a mentor. And thirdly, it's not outright stated since it's supposed to be ominous, but the killer is extremely proficient in creating animatronics. And we have actual evidence of him placing human teeth into a head previously. It suggests that Monday had removed his own teeth and placed those teeth within another person's mouth. And since it's a fire, there would be no way to identify the person by physical features, meaning that the teeth will be the only option. And since it's his own teeth, it's the best way to fake your own death and to become who you really want to be. In many ways, born again in Sherman's own hunting grounds. It goes without saying that this would look incredibly bad on the FBI since he was literally put on to investigate a serial killer that turned out to be him all along. And all whilst doing that, training the very FBI detective force on how to find the suspect. It allowed him to direct the FBI's focus however he saw fit, and it almost worked. After faking his death, this is where he started to assume a variety of aliases. We have further proof of this on a sheet of paper that literally contains his real name, which has been underlined at the top, Hector Waylon Monday. And all of the aliases that he chose to assume, including Leonard Kemp, Brandon Day, Ned Yoke, Benton T. Lyman, Richard Belknap, and of course, Grantham Demet. And while I will say that the killer having a piece of paper with his own true identity and all the aliases that he uses is incredibly on the nose and very stupid in my opinion. It's essentially Supermassive's way of slapping you across the face with the fact that the killer is FBI agent Monday. Not to mention that some other interesting tidbits and I suppose easter eggs is the fact that two of Monday's aliases, specifically Ned Yoke and Richard Belknap, take the surnames from the maiden names of HH's home's real-life wives. Also, Grantham Demet is an anagram of Herman Mudgett, the birth name of HH Holmes. And as to what Monday did once he faked his own death and assumed those identities, we can find a will amendment from a couple that owned the lighthouse. The amendment was made in the event of their deaths that their entire estate would be left to Richard Belknap, meaning Monday, who mainly goes by Grantham Demet now, tricked the couple into putting them into their will using the names Richard Belknap and Leonard Kemp. And as you could probably guess, the couple ended up meeting an unfortunate end, to nobody's surprise. This wraps up every single piece of background information and story that you can find, but the question has to be asked, what happened to Dumet? after the game's main story has concluded. Well, regardless of how many people die or if the entire group escaped the island, we can see that Monday survives no matter what, and the final scene shows a group of young people speaking about an invitation they received due to winning a competition, the prize, an all-expenses trip to an island resort for five. And who was that cheeky old boy in the window over there? None other than Grantham Demet, Richard Belknap, or Ned Yoke, or Agent Monday. You get the idea. Meaning that he is still up to his old ways even after the events of The Devil in Me. And that is the full story of the Dark Anthology's The Devil in Me. If you've made it this far, you're an absolute legend. It took a gigantic amount of research time and editing time to make this video, so I really do hope it helped. 
And if you could leave a like on the video, it helps us out more than you could imagine. Remember to sub for more Story Explained videos, and I currently have my eyes on Callisto Protocol, so be on the lookout for that. Until next time, peace.